So welcome again, if you joined during the meditation, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, so as I shared earlier, the theme for the evening that I wanted to explore together is this question of what is insight? How do we develop it or cultivate it? Uh, that came up on a call recently. I wanted to devote a little bit more time to it. And I found it can be helpful to think about insight in two or three different ways. Um, one is personal insight. Another is relational or, or social insight. And then a kind of deeper insight on the Dharma level, what we might refer to as more classical insight. So I want to say a little bit about each of these and give some examples um, and then talk some about how we arrive at or cultivate insight. So um, personal insight, you could think of it as psychological insight. These are shifts in understanding about our own life, um, our habits, our conditioning personally. You know, why am I so upset about this? Why did I get so defensive? Um, oh, I feel afraid or gosh, I, I didn't realize I feel really insecure about this. You know, oh, that's why I keep rehearsing that conversation. I, I really care about that relationship and I'm afraid if it doesn't go well, they'll cut me out. So one of the stories I like to tell about this kind of insight on the personal level, I was sitting in a retreat many years ago in my 20s, a particular time in my life where I didn't have much direction other than being interested in meditation and wanting to go deeper in the practice. And I felt a lot of anxiety and angst about what am I doing with my life, living at this meditation center, am I wasting my time? And this one particular meditation period, I wasn't even contemplating the question or anything. I was just sitting there observing my breath. And it just kind of dawned on me. I just recognized like, oh, I'm afraid. Like That's what this experience is, why I keep thinking about these questions and getting pulled. There's fear here. Just the recognition of this is how I feel which then opened up the possibility of actually attending to the fear, feeling it more clearly, observing it in my body, instead of letting it drive my thoughts and eat up all my energy and, and time. This is an example of kind of personal insight, psychological insight. And this is, this is sort of a byproduct of the meditation practice. It's not the point of it. It happens naturally. And as we explored a little bit, as I suggested during the meditation, you can also use the power of concentration and the, the, the clarity of the mind that we develop in meditation to investigate something more deeply and open to the possibility of some kinds of personal insight can use the practice in that way. And it can be very helpful. Another kind of insight um, we might call relational or, or even social insight. Um, and this is a kind of understanding that arises about our relationships. So it's not just about you know your own personality or conditioning or feelings, but something with another person or the ways in which the, the structures of our society, um, different collective forces have influenced us or created certain filters or assumptions or expectations in our own minds about how we will be perceived, what's possible for us. So instead of seeing those filters or assumptions as true and real, as facts of life, well, this is just how it is, we begin to recognize those um, as conditions that were brought into being through larger forces of, of history and society. One of the examples I like to give about this, um, that I think I, t I think I tell the story in my the book that Bill mentioned at the beginning, my, my newer book, Your Heart Was Made for This, is I was teaching a workshop with a, a female colleague and did something that many women 
know from experience and recognize men tend to do is she shared something and made a point and then I repeated it. Slightly different way, but essentially saying the same thing. And I noticed it. And I, I noticed not only that I repeated it, but I noticed why. I noticed that there was this assumption in my mind that my voice, a, a deeper male voice, somehow carried more weight in the room. And that if I repeated it, it mattered more. People would listen more if I said it. It was, a, it was a, a, an insight into the conditioning of patriarchy and sexism that was kind of embedded in my own mind. Nothing I chose, nothing to be ashamed of, nothing essential or personal to who I am. Just a kind of patterning that's there based on growing up in this particular time and society. And so there's an insight, seeing clearly of the pattern and where it comes from that arose because I was paying attention, open, observing. So we could call this relational insight or social insights, understanding on, on that level. That's the capacity to see the conditioning in our own mind that has been created through history and social forces. It's the saying in the Talmud that says, we, we don't see things as they are, we see them, we see things as we are. It's that sense of what is the filter that you're looking through and, and how, did it, how did it get there? Now, what we might call classical insight or Dharma insight goes even deeper than that. It's an understanding into a truth that we all share that's not unique to us either personally or even you know, collectively that you know, we share with others who are of the same gender or race or class or economic status or ability as us. It's seeing certain filters and conditioning, but on a much more primal level, the sort of uh, underlying structure of, of the very human mind and seeing how that mediates our experience of life. There's an insight into the way things are, into how life is. I remember one of the first insights I probably had as a little child was lying on my back looking up at the sky and just kind of doing nothing as um, children who have the, the blessing of living in, in a peaceful environment will do. And I noticed that the clouds were moving. I never noticed it before. The clouds were always just those, you know, fluffy white things up in the sky or the pictures of white things in books. And I remember all of a sudden realizing, whoa, Clouds move. There's just a shift in understanding. What I had assumed was fixed and static, I recognized was changing. It was the beginning of a much deeper insight into impermanence. Marcel Proust, the author and novelist, Proust said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And this is what insight meditation is designed to do, to help us to see with new eyes. So insight's not about having a special kind of mystical experience. It's about seeing what's always been here, but that we've never noticed before that we keep overlooking. Uh, another quote from the painter Georgia O'Keeffe that I love that really speaks to the essence of the meditative process in my mind. She, she said, still in a way, nobody sees a flower, really. It's so small. We haven't time. And to see takes time. Like to have a friend takes time. This is a beautiful description to me of the process of meditation. We're learning to befriend our own mind, our own life, this human experience, by giving our hearts full attention to it and really learning to see it clearly, to see through the assumptions and habits that we've cultivated to survive. When 
when we see things clearly, it's like a kind of magic. There's, a, there's an aha moment. It's that moment of eureka. You know, step into the bathtub and all of a sudden recognize like, oh, the water flows out. Principle becomes clear in our mind's eye. But how does this happen? How do we, how do we develop insight? It's not something we do. It's not something we produce. It's something that occurs naturally when the conditions are right. And so going back to that story about you know lying on my back in the yard as, as a kid, it's like I was relaxed. I felt safe. I was curious, open. I wasn't trying to get anything. And oh, seeing clearly. So one of the ways meditation practice works in the whole path is it's it's designed to increase the chances of insight arising by strengthening the underlying conditions that lead to it. So we develop mindfulness, concentration, equanimity, this kind of balanced non-reactivity. We develop the factors of awakening, mindfulness, interest, energy, joy, concentration, tranquility, equanimity. When those come into balance in the mind, our perception of reality changes. And again, we're not getting something, we're not creating anything. It's like, it's like the leaves in the forest fall down and all of a sudden you can see through the trees, see what's always been here in front of our eyes. There's that famous cartoon um, of, uh, of, of an image, and depending on how you look at it, it can look like two different things. One of the more famous ones is a line drawing, and you look at it one way, and it looks like um, a young woman's neckline turn, turning her head. And then if you look at it another way, it looks like a very old woman with a, with a big nose and kind of a cloak over her. And if you've only seen a picture in one way, you don't know the other pictures there. But if you relax your vision, maybe if someone helps point it out to you, all of a sudden it changes. You say, oh, oh, I see it now. There it is. And then once you've seen it once, you can kind of flip back and forth from the old way of seeing it and a new way of seeing it. So the, the practice of meditation and the whole path of, of Dharma is designed to give rise to insight into how and why we suffer. The goal is, is to understand the nature of human life and how suffering comes into being. The Burmese teacher Sayada Upandita, Sayada Utejaniya, uh, wrote, peace itself is not the goal. If peace were the goal, then when you can't achieve peace by meditating, you won't know what to do. When the goal is to understand, you can try to understand suffering too. So we're not trying to get somewhere. It's not about trying to feel peaceful or calm. The goal is to try to understand, to see clearly whatever's happening. Because it's through understanding that we unhook from suffering. So one of the ways insight is talked about, there are many ways it's talked about in the early Pali Canon in the Buddhist tradition, one of the most common is insight into the Four Noble Truths, this kind of central thesis of the Buddha's teachings, this analysis of how and why we suffer that essentially says there's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, it arises due to certain conditions, it can end, those conditions can cease, and that you can actually take steps to bring about that ending. And so the invitation is first to just reflect on and contemplate and come to an intellectual understanding of this teaching, which is its own kind of insight, its own kind of understanding. And then to take that to a deeper level, to really observe the mechanism of suffering as it arises and ceases in our own life, so that we begin to understand on a more visceral level how and why we suffer, where we get caught, and how that then becomes amplified on a much larger level in social systems and nations and, can, and leads to violence and war and greed and starvation. 
all of these terrible, horrific, violent things that occur in the human realm. So the, the teaching begins with this statement of one of the facts of life, that we suffer, there is dukkha, there is this experience of difficulty in life. And it's an invitation to look and see, is that true for each of us? You know, is there suffering? Is there hardship? Is there this aspect of being human that is hard to bear? It's not saying everything is suffering and awful, because that's not true. But it's saying there's this unavoidable aspect of life that's difficult, that's painful. Losing people we love is painful. Getting stuck with things we don't like is painful. Not getting what we want is painful. The anxiety of change, the insecurity of life is difficult. Some of you know, some of you who um, we know each other, practiced together before, know I, I have a toddler. Um, he's just turning two. It's remarkable to see the unfiltered, raw reaction to not getting what he wants. This is kind of primal, you know. Uh, if he doesn't get exactly what he wants immediately, he's at that stage where he just, it's awful. It's the end of the world. And he throws himself on the floor sometimes. It's just screaming, you know. Of course, it's not humorous in the moment. Sometimes it can be quite stressful on the nervous system. But there's something so beautiful about the, the purity of that, of allowing that conditioning. That's there in all of us. And of course, you know, we learn to let go a little, to have some equanimity. We don't get exactly what we want in certain circumstances. We roll with it, right? That's part of maturing. And yet, on some level, isn't that reaction still there in us with certain things? No, no, no. I have to have it this way. Whether it's something small or something much larger. And beginning to tease apart and understand the difference between our values. It's not that we don't have preferences. I'd much rather human beings didn't kill each other. I'd much rather there weren't people who were starving in a world where so much food goes to waste. So it's not that we don't care or say, well, that's just my suffering. But to notice the difference between this kind of um, fighting with reality that uses up all of our energy and just opening to the pain of the way things are. And this, so this moves into the second of the truth. So there's a cause to the distress we experience in our heart. It arises due to certain conditions that we don't actually fully grasp what's happening. There's a certain kind of ignorance present in all of our minds. We're not living with a full, clear, embodied recognition of what we've signed up for. And so, when things don't go the way we want them to, the way we think they should, there's pain, there's suffering. What is the ignorance? What is the mistake that we make? We see that which is changing, unstable, dependent, as something that is unchanging, stable, independent. And so we suffer. We expect the world to behave in a way that it's not designed to behave. We expect things to stay the same when they change. We expect others to do what we want when we don't control them. We expect there to be peace and justice when we know that human beings have these violent, selfish tendencies and the systems and structures of our world are built with those tendencies in mind and forming them. So of course we bomb and kill each other when we should be planting, planting trees and gardens and you know, preparing for a climate disaster. So the cause of suffering is, is looking inwardly and seeing how are we relating with the reality of the world we live in? 
Are we resisting, holding on, trying to control what we can't control? And again, that's not to say that we don't take action to affect change, but we look and see where is it coming from and are we out of alignment with the reality and the truth of the way things are? A very simple invitation to study this is to just look and see anytime you're suffering, anytime you're struggling, check and see, do you have an expectation about how things should be that you're holding on to? So the third noble truth is the um, promise of deliverance is saying it doesn't have to be that way. We can actually learn to see more clearly. We can actually learn how to live in harmony with the way things are. We can stop struggling and fighting so much and creating this unnecessary distress and struggle inside. We can stop trying to control other people and the world and instead move from a place of more freedom and lightness inside and make a real contribution without wasting our energy, without getting tied up in knots. And finally, there's a way to do that. There's a path to follow, which is this, um, not just the practice of meditation, but living an ethical life, doing making livelihood that doesn't cause harm, uh, speaking in ways that are kind and truthful, cultivating wisdom, all the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So this, this is one way of, um, one kind of insight. This is an insight into the Four Noble Truths. And this occurs in many different ways. It's a insight into the nature of life. One of the ways it gets talked about in the texts is knowing the way things are, the Buddha knowing the Dhamma, awareness knowing the truth. This is how it is. Famous line from Ajahn Sumedho, it's like this. This is how it is right now. It's not defeat. It's not apathy. It's clarity. It's recognition. This is how it is right now. This is the current state of affairs. Sobering recognition. Insight. This is from Sharon Salzberg from her book, Loving Kindness. This is the very nature of life. No one in this world experiences only pleasure and no pain. No one experiences only gain and no loss. When we open to this truth, we discover there's no need to hold on or to push away. This acceptance is the source of our safety and confidence. So that seeing clearly, oh, it's not personal to me, this loss, this diagnosis, this broken relationship, this financial hardship, this is just the way it is. Gain and loss, pleasure and pain, just changing. It's the nature of things. So in the meditation towards the end, I just didn't have a lot of time to go into it. I just invited a little bit of observing things change. So another way that insight um, can occur in meditation practice is known as the insight into the three characteristics. So I talked earlier a little bit about um, these misperceptions we have. We're not seeing clearly the way things are. So we mistake what is changing for being unchanging. We mistake um, what is really unreliable and ultimately not satisfying as being um, promising of fulfillment and satisfaction. We mistake that which is interdependent and um, uh, connected as being utterly independent. So I want to talk a little bit about each of these um, mistakes that we make, these misperceptions or kind of outdated maps we have in our mind. It's a kind of insight. The first of these and the most central is the insight into impermanence, that everything is changing, temporary, uncertain. And we all know this intellectually. We all get it on one level. And yet, right, when something big changes, aren't we shocked? Aren't we upset? Why? Why are we so shocked? And we wake up the next morning and all of a sudden everything's different. Well, yeah, 
the stability that we had taken so for granted was an illusion. Everything is uncertain. This is the truth of Anicca. There's a passage in the, in the canon where someone asks, like, what is it that Buddha, the Buddha knows is different than you or me? It's a very simple answer. All that arises passes away. All that is born dies. That's the, that's the insight. It's not far away. It's something each of us can see and know clearly and directly. But we overlook it because we're seeing through this assumption, this filter that things are stable. Everything's going to be as it is. But you can see this very clearly just with your own breath in meditation is this shift from the breath as a thing or even the breathing as a process, like I'm breathing, this is my breath, this is an in-breath, this is an out-breath, to all of a sudden starting to see it as it is. It's just this changing process, this shimmering, flittering, unsteady process. Each moment, it's new. Each moment, it's appearing and disappearing, vanishing, before it even comes into being. That's anicca. Recognizing impermanence doesn't mean we don't care. Doesn't mean we don't grieve when we lose someone we love or when something important or valuable goes away. But it, it takes some of the sting out of the loss. We're not so shocked. We remember, yeah. And this adds a, a kind of richness to appreciating life. So again, you know, raising a child, those of you who had the, the blessing of being parents, the opportunity, you know, the impermanence is just staggering, particularly at, the, at this age, you know, when they're so small and changing so quickly. And my wife and I, who are both practitioners, you know, talk about and reflect a lot on how tomorrow's not promised. Every day is a gift with our child. This is from Thich Nhat Hanh. If you know that things are impermanent, that the person you love today may die tomorrow or leave you tomorrow, then you come to the conclusion that what you can do to make her happy today, you have to do it today. Tomorrow may be too late. If the insight of impermanence is alive in us, we will not make this mistake. Our way of looking at him, at her, our way of smiling to them, our little gestures every day will be filled with love, understanding, and compassion. And if tomorrow something happens to them, you will not regret it. This is the wisdom transmitted by the Buddha, and that wisdom is based on your insight into impermanence. My wife works at the hospital. She gets in the car and drives to the hospital every day. I try to make a point of being present when we say goodbye. Not always successful. When my practice is stronger, I'm more successful because I never know if she's going to come home at the end of the day. That's the reality. That's the truth. This is living with the insight of impermanence. The next classical insight into the three characteristics is an insight into dukkha. A very difficult word to translate. It means something like unreliable difficult hardship and because everything's changing everything is unstable nothing is reliable there's a sense of it can't really nothing really can finally completely do it for us or satisfy us because eventually it's going to dissolve starting to see things in this way, which again, it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy life, that we can't experience pleasure and be enriched by it. But we stop making the mistake that this next purchase, this next 
trip, this next job, this next relationship, this next meditation retreat, whatever it is, is going to finally do it for us. We, we see that, that that very movement of seeking something to fill us up is a kind of delusion. It's based on a delusion. It's just craving. And that the fulfillment comes not from trying to get something, but from recognizing and realizing what's already here. Now, this insight or understanding into dukkha, into the, the unreliable, unstable nature of everything, actually opens up into a very, um, a very kind of tender and um, intimate space of connection. Because we realize that we're not alone, that this is that we're, we're all subject to this. And there's a very deep kind of compassion that comes out of this recognition. How vulnerable we all are in different ways and, and ultimately, you know, in the same way to sickness, loss, and death. And then finally, the third of these insights, um, which can be the hardest to really understand and grasp, um, is insight into anatta translated as not self or sometimes non self which is really a statement of um kind of like quantum reality of existence that everything is connected and nothing's independent everything exists in this kind of state of leaning on and depending on everything else you know, we tend to experience life, ourself and other people as these sort of separate entities interacting and moving around. But that's just a conventional reality. And so the insight into anatta is also an insight into um, interdependence and the relationships between things, that everything depends on everything else. And that the sense of control and agency we have in life is quite limited. There's a certain illusion to the amount of control we have. That life is ultimately ungovernable. We can't control what happens. We can't hold on to things. We can't bend. The number of things we can bend to our will is quite limited. It's not up to me. And so this occurs on many different levels, this kind of insight not taking things personally. It's the most kind of colloquial way of saying it. Yeah. Beginning to have a different relationship with our thoughts, our emotions, even our body. We get sick or get a condition. We recognize like, oh, the body's sick. I'm not sick because I'm not this body. Some belief, you know, I'm a failure. I can't do it. We see that just for what it is, a thought and an emotion, a belief. We recognize it's just temporary, this sort of coming together of different patterns and habits. And the more we pick it up and make it into a person, this is who I am, the more we suffer. The more we see it clearly as just part of being human and not something essential, the, the more free we are. And these aren't, it's not like, we're slapping this filter on top of experience. It's not like, oh, that's not me. And so we disconnect and get really distant or cold. This is a way of observing and investigating life, trying to see it more clearly. What is this really? The insights into anatta. Remember one retreat I was sitting, standing outside and felt the wind on my face. And there's this moment of about, you know, recognizing the wind. And then the, the insight occurring, because the mindfulness was strong, concentration was strong, the mind was stable. And the experience of the wind, I wasn't just recognizing what's actually happening is that there was hearing, there was pressure, there was coolness, tingling this whole sort of constellation of sensations and sounds that on the conventional level we recognize as the wind, but there's really no wind. 
That's a concept. That's a thought in the mind. Yes, there's a force moving through the air, but on an experiential level, there's just these kind of pixels of experience. This is an insight into the nature of things. And we can see this at deeper levels, the deepest level of who am I? What am I? Am I these thoughts, these feelings, this history, this narrative, this awareness? And starting to see more clearly that who and what we are is free, is open. Some of the analogies that, that I've found helpful in, in grasping this before having some kind of actual connection with it through practice is like a rainbow. Do are, are there rainbows? Yeah. Hopefully you've seen one. I've seen many. Double rainbow. <laughs> is there really a rainbow there? Can you touch it? If you try to go and find it, is it there? No. Nothing there. It's an appearance. The appearance is real. There is an appearance, but it's just this temporary coming together of light and moisture and perspective and whoop, get a rainbow. And everything is like that. Everything. You, me, governments, nations. It's a rainbow, an appearance. The appearance is real. It exists in one way, but when you go to find it, there's nothing really there. And the practice opens up into this. We cultivate mindfulness, concentration, equanimity, interest, joy, in order to see clearly who we are, how we got here, and what it is to be human, how and why we suffer. Now, the real kicker, and this is where I'll end, is that oftentimes an insight is just the beginning. You see things in a new way, and then comes the real work of actually integrating it and learning to live that way. When you say goodbye to your loved one every morning, remembering and really being present. And Thich Nhat Hanh wrote, if you've seen once, you can see forever. And that's why we practice. Thank you so much for your kind and generous attention and listening. I hope there was something useful in this for you. Anything that wasn't useful, just leave it here. And anything that was useful, I hope you can continue to be nourished by it. So we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Um, I will open the, the chat. Um, and also want to just make um, one announcement. Um, some people, some folks asked me for more information about my own meditations and work. So I'm just going to put two links in the chat there. Um, one is to um, my newsletter. And if you're not on my newsletter, when you sign up, you get some free meditations. So I don't send a lot of emails. I'm a parent of young children. But um, if you want to get more meditations, that's one way to do that. And then um, they're running some discounts on my book right now. So um, if you're interested in learning more and reading, um, that link there in the chat also has uh, some good discounts on the book. So how can I be of support? What, uh, what questions do you have? Um, yeah, let's see. Farah, is that right? Am I saying it right? That's right, Farah. Hi. Thank you so much. It was a lovely meditation and lovely talk. Uh, the question that I have uh, for a while is about this uh, new science of uh, love and how, how does that love attraction goes with this uh, kind of training? Yeah, uh, thank you. So the whole thing about that, yes, you can with the, uh, you know, appropriate attention and concentration, uh, you can uh, actually gain what you are asking for. Yeah. And how is that with uh, Buddhist practice? Yeah, I don't think that idea is consistent with Buddhist practice. It's a very common sort of 
popular new age idea and there's this whole schools of theory behind it. Some people really feel inspired by it because um, it promises something, you know, and get more of what you want. It kind of feeds on craving in a certain way. Um, but that idea that you can control the universe, get more of what you want is not consistent with my understanding of Buddhism. Now there is something within the Dharma um, that um, That's it. is related. There's a couple of things that are related, like um, the law of karma, which is the law of action, which says the more you do something, the more likely you are to keep doing it. So, and this is borne out through modern neuroscience and Hebsian neuroplasticity that, you know, if you practice being kind and generous and patient, you become kind and generous and patient. That doesn't mean that people are going to be kind and generous and patient with you, but it means that your internal atmosphere, you will live in your own heart and mind in an atmosphere that is more kind and generous and patient because you've created that, you've cultivated that. That's not controlling the universe or bringing things to you. It's crafting your own heart and mind. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Elaine. Thank you so much for a uh, peaceful time of a very, very busy day. Um, if I may, I wanted to go back and, and my I have a funky connection, so I can't come online. I can hear you fine. Um, I wanted to go back to the, the situation that you described with a colleague and repeating what she said. And my question is, when when you didn't know, when you didn't have that realization that that would be um, uncomfortable for her. Oh, yeah. Um, um, and when you realize that, it, it seems to mm -hmm. me, I guess, depending where you are on this journey, that that you weren't suffering when you didn't know, but then when you did know, there would be a degree of suffering. Yeah. Um, and And so what's interesting to me is this, like, I mean, you know, people say ignorance is bliss in a way, but, but when you didn't know you weren't suffering and then when you realized it, there is a yeah. degree of suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, so part of the story I didn't tell was that the next thing I did was I, I, I commented on it in the room <laughs> just to kind of acknowledge, I don't know how it made her feel in the moment, but I commented on it and kind of use it as a teachable moment, but this is part of the practice and um, we become more sensitive to suffering as we practice and see more clearly. So um, my colleague and, and friend, uh, Jeff Warren, has a, a, a very handy phrase for this. He talks about the practice and the path, uh, the trajectory of it is feel more, suffer less. So we do feel more, but the sense of the actual suffering of it, the distress, the grind, that that goes down. So I didn't move into beating myself up. I'm such an awful person. Why did I do this? All these years of meditating and still, there wasn't this whole kind of elaboration. Um, there was actually some joy and delight. I'm like, whoa, look at that. That's amazing. Now, yeah, there are times when I notice something in myself and there is dismay or distress, you know, and and when there is a kind of reaction or shame, there's a capacity to to be with that and prevent it from elaborating or getting, you know, going into a down spiral. But I think you're absolutely right. There is a kind of a, a sensitizing and tenderizing of the heart as we open more and more to what it is to be human. And it's, it's through that opening and feeling more that we reclaim a certain kind of vitality and discover a different kind of freedom that comes not from controlling things or tamping down the intensity of some some pain or distress, but actually release being released from the need to control things because the heart is more resilient and the different feelings and experiences that we have can come and go and wash through us. And there's a certain quality of, um, of spaciousness and almost a kind of 
exhilaration that can come from that experience of being undefended and being able to know and trust that we can handle whatever comes. So I hope that's helpful. So my friends, we're at the end of our time. Debbie, I'm so sorry. I won't have time to get to your question, but perhaps at, a, at another session. Um, it's wonderful to be together, friends. Uh, I will be going on paternity leave soon, but I am teaching uh, some retreats in December and next year that will have a, a hybrid and online portion if you're unable to travel. Um, so maybe see you again there uh, or at another at another time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Bill. Take good care, everyone.